So uh, this is a project called Chroma, Cultural Heritage Review Map, Map Accessibility Towards Consistent Fair Map Key for Data Observed from Archaeological Fieldwork. It's basically looking at 30 years worth of uh, field survey and airborne area photographic transcription work done through the former Royal Commission and now Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, I work for Historic Environment Scotland, so I've got the data. Uh, I've got issues about combining data from different projects. So working with colleagues at the University of South Wales for the data science, it's Kerry Binding, Doug Tudub, and also um, somebody called Fabio Crameri, who's a colour scientist. He specialises in how colour works with maps. And he's got a background in working with um, geological maps, which is slightly different from the, the ask I've, I've asked him. But uh, anyway, so colour vision divisions, it affects about 4.5% of the UK population. 112 men and 1200 women. So it's a, it's a significant minority of, of, of our audience. There's various forms. I'm not going to go and try and pronounce the technical names. There's basically no red, no green, no blue. It's also a new color, which is very restricted what you can see. Uh, mapping is considered exempt from web, web accessibility guidance, but that nevertheless, we should still try and attempt to address the issue and reach out to as much of the audience as possible. As I say, we, we've gathered uh, a wealth of survey data over, I think it's since about 1990, we've, we've been capturing digi data digitally in the field through, first of all, electronic dis distance measurement equipment, and then laterally DGPS, so highly accurate survey information. That's complemented by a, a separate program of aerial transcriptions using the, the aerial program. Um, together, we've, we've mapped about 12,000, 13,000 sites and we we have a, an internal map legend which we've, we we we've broadly ca categorised the, the the different types of monuments uh, informally on a project by project basis with no set standards over the years. So there's a bit of drift over how terms have been applied. And I would say when we started this project, there's no such thing as a thesaurus. Uh, back in the nineties, the, the, the historic England was not historic England fish thesaurus monument types was published in the early two thousands. So there was a lot of free text as well. So there's a lot, always been a lot of data cleaning and uh, data alignment. Uh, so trying to address uh, accessibility, we have an issue obviously with background mapping. We can't control what's, what's displayed in the background maps. The ordnance survey maps are rich in color. And obviously ortho imagery, got, you've got the natural colors of the, of the images. The ordnance survey have addressed the issue through, through, through their own data scientists and color vision to, to, to come up with more, more color friendly palettes uh, that meet, meet accessibility guidance where possible. So we're trying to display data on top of that. So it's even, even more complicated trying, trying to work with existing color ranges. Um, this is an example from um, our Canmore data. We, we've published the airborne mapping for, for, for Inveresk outside Edinburgh, Musselburgh. So uh, it's a palimpsest of Neolithic and Roman and industrial and agricultural features over time. On the left, we see, see it in the, the normal vision, what somebody sees when they go to the Canmore map website and take a screenshot of that and drop it into an emulator to see, to, to show what it would look like to somebody who's got no green vision. And we can do that for all the different color ranges. And some of them, some of them work quite well. Some of them, the, 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 the different categories blur into each other. So as I say, we used terminologies before 2000s. We didn't have the, the thesaurus. We then applied the thesaurus to, to the, the classifications, which is uh, fine, except that the thesaurus is a polyhierarchical structure. Uh, in this example, a bar dwelling can be um, categorized as both agricultural and a domestic and also monument by form. So there's three options that people can start to index things. Uh, also buildings and fu change function over time. So uh, we, we, we felt for the map view that actually we want to say it's a, it's, it's a structure or a building as opposed to an agricultural or domestic structure. Um, and by, by having that, grouping them as buildings, it, it, it condenses the, um, uh, the legend and simplifies the legend. But even so, mapping the terms across has been, has been, been, been challenging. There's drift, as I say, there's drift over time and different projects have different views of how the terms are used. So we also want to address interoperability, fair data principles that Alfie talked about earlier. Um, we, we, we've got a thesauri, 2000, well, 2012 or 2014, 
who worked with the University of South Wales and colleagues of Historic England and the Royal Commission in Wales to create linked data, ver linked data versions of our various thesauri, and they're published on heritage data. So that, that by, by, by using the, 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 the linked data versions, we, we, we're, we're, we're addressing interoperability. But again, the variety of terms and, and the options in the, in the hierarchical structure makes it quite challenging to um, have a consistent, uh, apply, apply the values consistently within a flat file GIS format. So uh, first task was to actually sit down and review the um, monument thesaurus. And uh, there's, two there's 2,700 instances of different terms representing the, the thesaurus. So there's some terms are mapped once, got one, one direct relationship in the hierarchy, or may, may, may map to two or more um, top level terms. There are 18 top level terms, which is far too much to inform a meaningful uh, map legend. So we took those terms, sat down and worked out what, what, the, what the values we want to show on the map are. So we've got a very condensed map legend. Uh, we've got it down to about 10, 10 separate values. Um, and the, 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 the colourful part on the right hand side of the screen shows how, how we've taken the, the original thesaurus and mapped them into these series of categories or um, collection of, of values. It's not perfect. There are there are exceptions. Um, right. So I was just explaining how we how we're taking the thesaurus and mapping mapping the two thousand seven hundred terms the top eight to eighteen top level categories down to um, eight or ten values that we want to display in the map. And I'm just going to pass over to Kerry Binding, who's going to talk through his part of the project. Yeah, we're operating as a a tag team here. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about uh, our involvement in the project. Um, Here's some examples of legends that are used in, in typical systems, GIS systems that we found. Um, I think one of them is Canmore, past map, and something like the land cover classifications. You can see the various uh, colors and, and sometimes shapes are used as well to distinguish information, textures or patterns, or even images could be used in addition to colors. Uh, so one of the first things we did, uh, Peter mentioned earlier on the, the emulation features. Um, we found that Google Chrome has got some quite nice uh, emulation features in the background in the developer tools. If you look under the, uh, the Lighthouse tab, there's a rendering option uh, you see in the top right there. And you can, you can emulate those different conditions that Peter listed earlier on. And so we can see the difference between the, the, what we term the normal vision on the left-hand side and the emulated uh, condition in the center there. And so you can see that some of the colors start to look quite similar then. And you can see, helps us to actually visualize what the issue is if we don't suffer from those, those, those issues ourselves. And it helps us to identify what are problematic color combinations. Um, we found that sometimes just not necessarily having different colors, but varying the shade of a particular color can make a difference because you can, you can still distinguish the differences and it doesn't really matter what the colors actually are. Um, ideally, we wouldn't rely on color alone to convey meaning, but we, we tend to do it quite a lot. Um, one of the first things we did was, was wanted to be able to build our own legends to, to test out different uh, color combinations. So we built this little um, tool to edit and share legends and, and try out different color combinations and see what was happening. And then to, to use a uh, browser to emulate the different uh, color conditions. This is uh, a small tool that's open source um, online and under GitHub. You can, you can download and use it or it's, it's already deployed as a, a GitHub Pages site. So it's a tool that's just online and, and you can just plug in your own colors and use it. It's a bit of a work in progress, only just created just, just for us to create these lists. Um, so we're open to any ideas to improve that. Um, the, the background, you, you just um, import, export as JSON, sim simple structure. Um, you can import from a file that you, you've just keep locally, or you can, you can put things on, on URLs if you want to store stuff in GitHub or on a shared, some sort of shared cloud system. Um, so we're not just creating lists of colors. That's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, Peter mentioned also the uh, vocabulary being mapped to the categories of the, of the legend. Um, so we, I'm going to say we, Peter, uh, mapped a whole set of, of vocabulary concepts from the uh, Scottish Monuments Thesaurus 
to a uh, distilled down set of high level overarching categories that he produced. And these categories are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Obviously, some concept concepts could belong to more than one category there. Um, and then you can, you can, of course, associate suitable uh, palette of colors with those categories. Hopefully, they're, they're um, safe in terms of, of, of color vision deficiency. And we can use this, this technique to evaluate and improve the accessibility of the, the systems that we have. Um, where it gets kind of interesting for me is, is in the background data structures that we might use to, to model these legends and categories. Um, and normally, they're just a picture on the, on the screen there. But actually, we can, we can do better than that. Creating a legend itself is a, is a kind of form of classification. You're classifying the data in, in your own way. Um, and it kind of circumvents the, the rigid hierarchical structure of the thesaurus because you can create collections which are collections of, of concepts from a thesaurus which are particular to your own use case. Um, so we used um, the SCOS collection um, to, to model a legend, legend being a collection of categories. A category is another SCOS collection. And then the category um, contains as members SCOS concepts. That's the model we used. Um, then we associate other things with the categories, such as colors, possibly textures, um, labels, etc. Um, category could be a member of more than one legend. If you've, if you've got predefined categories and you want to create multiple legends, you could do that. And obviously, concepts could be members of more than one category. Um, but the, you then need to decide in the user interface how you're going to display that because they're going to be different colors. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. Uh, so we can then sort of serialize that data in terms of RDF. And so there's a little extract of the kind of thing that we've done in the background. We've got a category of monuments. Uh, we've got the, the top level legend, sorry, of, of the monuments. Um, it's got a particular type, which is a, an, an AAT class, AAT uh, concept, third label, and then these members, which themselves are the categories of the legend. And then there's one of the categories underneath cultivation. And you can see it's associated with a color and it has members underneath, which are concepts from the Scottish Monuments Thesaurus. Um, we kind of avoided trying to create a, a whole new model with custom elements and properties. We just use the base sort of SCOS collection and, and uh, typical properties that we can use with that, such as the preferred label and the members. Um, you could be a bit more explicit in the modeling and create subclasses of SCOS collection, which are legends and legend items or categories. Um, but at the moment, we haven't gone down that route, but it's, it's a very simple thing to do. And then there's some examples of querying on that data once you've got it into that form. Uh, the first one on the left-hand side, listing categories of the monuments legend with the associated colors and the count of the concepts that you've associated with those categories. And then top right, looking for what category a particular concept falls under and what color is associated with that category. And then the bottom right, um, listing the concepts that are members of a particular category, in this case, cultivation. So we've got the concepts that we've chosen to map to cultivation. Uh, we talked a bit about accessibility. Our primary focus has only been on one aspect of accessibility. There's the web content accessibility guidelines, which we, we put a, a link to in the end, which give a lot more advice on other aspects of accessibility navigability, understandability, readability, predictability, et cetera. And I, I thought it was important to point out, it may be obvious to, to a lot of people who, who are, are more au fait with FAIR, but the A in FAIR doesn't mean accessibility in this sense. When they talk about accessibility, they're referring to having identifiers for concepts and having protocols for authorization to the data. It's, I think it's a little unfortunate they, they overloaded the word accessibility because accessibility really means something in, in web UI context, at least. So when we're talking about accessibility in FAIR, FAIR is to ensure machine-based accessibility to data, whereas the web content accessibility guidelines are ensuring human-based accessibility to data. So obvious to, to a lot of you, I guess. Um, there's a couple of useful resources that we came across along the way, various uh, palettes and, and if different ideas about uh, safe web colors to use with, with CVD conditions. 
and I'll, I'll hand over to Peter to do the reminder of the slides. Then. So as, as Kerry said, we, we, we can do so much in, in visualizing and emulating how um, our, our map data works through, through, through um, uh, emulators, but we're not specialists. And so we're working with Fabio Cremeri, who's a color scientist who can then refine the legends so that they, 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 they work cohesively together. At least that's the theory. Um, so this is just work in progress. This is the standard view on the top left, and then the no red, the no green, and the no blue. And you can see how um, the colors still retain, the, uh, are still retained, the, the differences are still retained in, in a map view. The other thing we wanted to do was to test interoperability of the data of our approach with other data sets and by um, lucky coincidence i guess historic england re released that firstly their aerial archaeology mapping explorer online web map which you could explore um there there are 30 years more of aerial transcriptions uh, this is a, an example of um the tweed valley the border between england and scotland the areas in red are uh for, for, uh, transcriptions from the Historic Environment Scotland transcription program. We, we, we don't really respect the border. We've flown and transcribed things in England. But uh, in, the, in the Map Explorer, you can drop in the data sets to see how they work. However, we're using, we're, we're displaying the information in a slightly different way. So uh, I wanted to test the data. It's now, the data is now available for download. So this is just an example again. This is what you see. The English English view of the, the how they present their information, very simple structure, um, legend of structure, ditches, banks, extent of features, ridge and furrow. It's a, it's a more simplified version of the landscape they're trying to present. So, whereas we 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 break things down by the red is the the settlement, brown is uh, cultivation, and green cult um, Brown is land use and green is cultivation. And this is the combined data set uh, using, using the same uh, map legend applied to both the historic England data sets and our own. Lessons learned from that exercise. If you've got different features um, from different data sets and you overlay them, the colors change. <laughs> I need to talk to, 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 to Fabio about how we, how we address that. But more importantly, we're, all, we're both using the Fish Monument Thesaurus but the way we we view things and the way we use the terms is different. So in the, the bottom left is the uh, legend um, defined by monument type. The, there's a double ditched enclosure and a bank, which are described as uh, land use, if you like. And then there's a, a settlement, which they've separated out the enclosure ditch. Uh, and, and the green is a macula, uh, an and amorphous thing, which when I look at it through the Scottish lens, it's very much a settlement type. So. Uh, the interoperability only goes so far. There's a lot more information on um, interpretation. Um, that's it. Just to say, we're very grateful to the Historic Scotland uh, Foundation for funding the project as a contribution to Historic Environment Scotland's Equalities Action Plan and the different roles in the project. Fabio Cremeri is looking at the uh, colour science. Kerry Binding, Doug Tudup are developing the um, collection, the, the, how, how to model the data. So thank you very much.